Hi everyone, hope you all must be doing great. So let's start with the PGBP revision. And in the last lecture, we were discussing about section 43B. 43B is a very important section. It says that there are certain expenses which are allowed only when they are actually paid by the SSE. And if they are not paid, we are not going to allow it. And they should be paid up to the due date of ROI. And there is one amendment also which we have I have already discussed in the last lecture. It was regarding MSME. So you have to see whether there is a written agreement or there is no written agreement. If there is a written agreement, then the payment should be made as per the written agreement or 45 days, whichever is lower. You have to make the payment up to that date. If it is made on a cruel basis, we are going to allow it. And if it is not made up to that date, we are not going to allow it on a cruel basis. We will allow only when it is actually paid. So out of there are some six or seven expenses are there 43B, but MSME is quite a special one because for remaining expenses, it says that it should be paid up to the due date of ROI. But for MSME, it says that it should be paid as per the MSME Act. And second thing was, if there is no written agreement, then it should be made within 15 days. If it is made, uh, the payment is made within 15 days, then we can allow it on a cruel basis. And if it is not made within 15 days, we are not going to allow it on accrual. We will be allowing only when the amount is actually paid. Right? You remember that? So let's come to another section, section 43.1. 43.1 is actual cost. Because whenever we have to compute depreciation on any asset, right? So we, you understand, you will, uh, you calculate your depreciation block wise. And you also uh, do that calculation additions during the year. So if you have purchased any machine, so what is the actual cost which you have to take, right? And even it is used at many places. Let's say you are have you have purchased a, a set for scientific research purpose, and you have to uh, you understand that you will be allowing hundred percent of deduction. So on what amount you will be allowing hundred percent deduction? That is the actual cost of an asset. So what is the actual cost which we we have to take in different sections? That is mentioned under section forty three one. So what is the actual cost here means? So uh, there is a thumb rule, sir. Yes, there is a thumb rule. Whatever the expenses which you have incurred up to the date of put to use, please capitalize all these things. So although I'll read what is written over there in section 43.1, but please remember there is a thumb rule. The thumb rule says that whatever the expenses which you incur up to the date of put to use, please include everything. See, so it says that if the purchase price of the asset should be included, right? No problem at all. If there is any taxes, let's say if there is any GST or custom, please include that, right? We understand if we are getting any input tax credit of uh, GST or if we are getting any duty drawback of custom, then we can subtract. But otherwise, first of all, please include everything, right? Then installation cost, freight inward, transit insurance, include everything. And one more thing which you, you must remember when I was discussing with you section 36 that in section 36 interest is allowed. If you have taken interest, if you have taken loan and you are paying interest, interest is also allowed. But if you have taken interest for purchase of any asset, for purchasing any asset, you have taken an interest, then up to the date the asset is put to use till that period, the interest should be capitalized. So this is all also written over here, interest on borrowing up to the date of put to use up to the date of put to use you have to add this one also then if you receive any subsidy because here we are discussing about actual cost what is the actual cost for the assessi let's say if the assessi has purchased a machine for rupees let's say a machine is getting purchased of rupees 10 lakh and some other person gives them a subsidy let's say government or any other person gives them a subsidy that you are doing a wonderful job let us let us give you a subsidy of 2 lakh. So I have spent it 10 lakh and I received 2 lakh, right? So my cost is how much? Just 8 lakh. So this is very logical that if you receive subsidy, so is it mandatory that subsidy can be received from government only? Can any other person can also give you subsidy? The answer is yes. Here you can receive the subsidy from any person. So I have written it from any form of subsidy. You have to subtract it, right? And because we have already included all the taxes over here and if you are getting any ITC credit or any if there is any custom so you will read that in your 
CA final level that in customs, if we, are, if we get any refund of that custom duty that we call duty drawback or refund of customs. So you can subtract that also. So input tax credit, if you are getting anything, input tax credit, you must have understand. You, you must have understood because you must have already covered your GST lectures also. Right. So IDC, you can uh, subtract. And if there is any exchange rate fluctuation, it might happen that you have purchased a set from outside India. If you have purchased an asset from outside India, right? And if you are paying them in US dollar or you are paying them in any foreign currency. So it might happen that whenever you are making the payment, that that currency can get fluctuated, right? It can increase or it can decrease. So you have to make that adjustment also. If let's say the uh, that currency is increased, so you have to pay more money. So whatever the extra amount which you are paying, that will increase your actual cost. And if you are, uh, let's say, if you are getting a profit while making a payment, let's say the foreign currency gets depreciated. In that case, you will save some amount, right? So whatever the amount which you are paying extra due to the foreign currency fluctuation or you have saved something, then it should be adjusted. So this is a very uh, important section also and very easy also that how you will be calculating your actual cost, right? And this you all know that if you have made a payment of more than 10,000 rupees in cash, in it can be in cash, it can be in bearer check, it can be in cross check. So if the payment is made of more than 10,000 rupees, you are not going to allow it. You are not going to allow it if it is made by account paycheck, bank draft or any bank transfer like N or any FT, RTGS, UPA, etc. Then we can allow it. So if it is more than 10,000, let's say uh, a CSE has purchased a asset, let's say a machine for rupees 25,000. And it is mentioned in the question that that a CSE has made the payment in cash. Please don't uh, allow depreciation on it. Don't allow any de deduction on it because it will not be considered there, right? So if it is made in excess of 10,000, we are going to disallow. And this is again an, an important point over here. Let's say uh, this is actually explanation 5 to section 43.1. But please, you don't have to remember this number. No need to remember this number. But let's say if you have a personal building, if you have a personal building, let's say I have a personal residence and later on after one year, two year, three year, I just convert that personal building into my, I just bring that personal building into my business. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm now started using it as my business asset. So because now I'm using it as my business asset, I will be calculating depreciation also on that particular building. So the question is, what is the actual cost of the building which I should enter that into my book so that I can compute depreciation? So section 43.1 explanation 5 has clearly explained that if there is any building, if there is any building which was initially purchased as for personal purpose and now you are bringing this into your business. So whatever is the original cost of the building, just subtract the deemed depreciation. Deemed depreciation, you have to subtract whatever the depreciation would have been if it would have used from the very beginning in business. So you have to subtract the deemed depreciation also. Then whatever the amount which remains, that amount will become the actual cost. But please remember, this is only for personal building. Let's say examiner might confuse you. Examiner will say, that a CC has purchased a personal car some two years back. They have purchased a personal car for rupees five lakh. Okay. After two years, they are bringing this car into your business. They are bringing that car into your business. So what amount, what is the actual cost of the car now? So uh, some students will think, sir, for, for uh, building, we have, we know that for building, if it is uh, converted uh, from personal to business, then we have to subtract the deemed depreciation. So the same logic they will apply there as well. Please don't do this mistake. That explanation is only for building. That explanation is only for building. So if there is any other asset like car, it's a personal car. If it was purchased for five lakh, bring it to your business at that value only. You don't have to subtract any depreciation. So it is only for building that you have to subtract that depreciation, not for any other set. I believe that you must have recorded this point also. Okay, so if personal building is transferred to business, the actual cost is taken as original cost minus deemed depreciation. Please remember that it should not, this logic, this particular provision should be applied only in case of building, not for any other asset, right? 
and if any other asset like car etc is uh, now bringing you are bringing uh, you are uh, initially it was for personal and now you are bringing into your business please bring it you can bring it the at original cost only okay so this was section 43 one next section is section 40 small b remuneration to partners we understand that if the assessee is a partnership firm the assessee is a partnership firm assessee can pay certain remuneration to their partners but there is a limit on that assessee assessee means a partnership firm can pay certain remuneration to the partners but there is a restriction on that also so what is this rest restriction it is mentioned under section 40 small b first of all if you are it this remuneration can be in the form of salary it can be in the form of bonus this can be in the form of commission interest on capital it can be uh, such remuneration right so first of all just see if you are paying interest on capital if you are paying interest on capital you can partnership firm can pay interest on capital to all the partners as per the partnership deed they can pay even even that partner is a sleeping partner also we can pay the interest on capital because interest why interest on capital is paid to partners because they have invested the amount in the business they have invested their sum of money in the business that is the reason we are giving them interest on capital interest on capital can be given to all the partners irrespective of that whether they are active partners or they are sleeping partners no problem at all interest on capital can be given to all the partners as per the partnership deed but if it is mentioned in the partnership deed that the rate of interest on in capital is 13 percent or 14 percent 15 percent no maximum rate which we have to take is 12 percent per annum simple interest right are you able to recall this so the maximum if the partnership deed says 11 percent then 11 percent is okay with us we will allow 11 percent if partnership deed says 10% we will allow 10% but if partnership D says DD it says more than 12% no maximum is 12% per annum to all the partners so this point was important to all the partners and other remuneration what about other remuneration can we pay salary to partners can we pay bonus to partners can we pay commission to partners the answer is yes we can pay other remuneration to partners also no problem but it can be paid only and only to working partners. We are not going to pay it to non-working partner. It is allowed only if they are paid to a working partner. So other remuneration like salary, bonus, commission, etc. It can be allowed only to working partners, not to anyone else. Maximum amount which can be allowed is this is important. This is important. Examiner does ask such type of question in examination so what you have to do is you have to calculate book profits first of all how these book profits are calculated so book profits first of all you have to compute normal pgbp normal pgbp as if uh, before allowing any remuneration before allowing any remuneration to partners just um, uh, you have to calculate normal pgbp as if you are calculating pgbp of an individual right just calculate normal pgbp if depreciation is not as per section 32 please give it as per section 32 whatever the provisions which we did uh, till now you have to apply those provisions but before allowing any remuneration to partners before allowing any interest to partners first of all calculate pgbp okay sir we will calculate pgbp then whatever the interest is allowed to the partners you can deduct it from that so first of all pgp for the firm before any interest or remuneration to partners then you have to deduct interest allowable whatever the interest this portion you can deduct whatever is allowable that you can deduct and any brought forward unabsorbed depreciation right now we are calculating book profits guys we are calculating book profits so if there is any unabsorbed depreciation of previous years preceding years if there is any unabsorbed depreciation please remember i am not saying brought forward or uh, brought forward business losses i am saying only brought forward unabsorbed depreciation if there is any unabsorbed depreciation you can subtract that while calculating the book profit so brought forward unabsorbed depreciation can be subtracted not brought forward losses right so this you will get your book profits so what you have to do is first 3 lakh of book profit so let's say your book profits comes down to 4 lakh rupees so what you have to do is for first 3 lakh 
separate first three lakh out of it and the remaining you have to uh, this is one lakh which you have to take 60 percent i'll tell you uh, just after a minute so first of all let's say your book profits is four lakh just segregate them into two parts first three lakh keep it here remaining whatever the amount is keep it separate so on first three lakh you have to compute 90 percent of such profits or one lakh fifty thousand whichever is higher whichever is higher so what you have to take is you have to take first three lakh of book profits one lakh fifty thousand or ninety percent of such book profits whichever is higher and for remaining you have to take sixty percent of book profit sixty percent of book profits and this is the whatever the amount you will receive here and here this is the maximum remuneration which you can allow to the partners which you can allow to the partners correct so let's say your book profit comes down to rupees seven lakh rupees okay so first three lakh and remaining would be four lakh so first three lakh you have to do 90 percent this will be uh two lakh seventy thousand or 150 whichever is higher so you will get 270 okay you will get 2.7 lakh and remaining is four lakh four lakh into 60 percent four lakh into 60 percent you will get how much uh, it will be two lakh forty thousand right two lakh forty thousand so 2.7 from here 240 from here so that makes uh five lakh ten thousand five lakh ten thousand you can this is the maximum remuneration which you can pay to the partners if you have paid more than that more than this amount please don't allow that only allow to this particular extent and if you have paid less than it uh, less than this sum amount then it is okay because this is the maximum amount which you can allow correct let's say you can ask me sir what if if book profits comes to rupees three lakh only just three lakh that's fine first three lakh please take it out from here and remaining would be zero so you have to ignore this portion you have to take only for this first three lakh 90 percent of such book profits or 150 whichever is higher so 90 percent would be 2.7 lakh and 150 is a fixed amount whichever is higher would be 270 and from this you have not uh, received anything so maximum is 2.7 lakh okay one one or uh, one more example let's say if uh, the book profit comes down to rupees 2 lakh just 2 lakh then what you have to do is you have to take first 3 lakh out of it but you cannot take first 3 why because it is just 2 lakh rupees so whatever the amount is take that out okay so sir from this 2 lakh we cannot take 3 lakh out from it so whatever the amount is we will take this particular keep uh, this 2 lakh would be separate remaining would be zero okay you have to forget about remaining so for this 2 lakh you have to take 90 percent of such book profits that will be 1 lakh 80 thousand or 150 whichever is higher it would be 1 lakh 80 thousand here so you can pay maximum remuneration of 1 lakh 80 thousand to your partners got it if the SAC that is the partnership firm has shown that they have paid more than 180 in this case then we will allow only 180 and if they have paid less less is okay because 180 is the maximum this is the guys this is the maximum remuneration right let's say book profits comes down to 1 lakh rupees okay so first three lakh you cannot take first three lakh out of this because this is just one lakh so for one lakh you will take 90 percent of such book profits that would be 90 thousand or 150 whichever is higher whichever it is lower or higher it is higher so 150 right and here there is nothing so 150 is the maximum amount which you can pay to the partners right so if our book profits is zero no problem if it is zero first three lakh would be zero so zero into 90 percent again it will come nil zero and 150 whichever is higher that would be 150 instead if the book profits in spite of that the book profit is zero you can still pay one lakh fifty thousand as remuneration so, so after paying remuneration there would be loss it's okay it's okay there could be loss but yes you can pay 150 to your uh this one lakh fifty thousand is the maximum amount right you can pay up to one lakh fifty thousand also if there is a loss in the in the partnership firm they can also pay remuneration but not more than one lakh fifty thousand right so this was section forty small b next section is section forty four double a forty four double a is again a very important section both from examination point of view also practically also but right now we are doing revision for the sake of examination purpose forty four double a is very important section guys 
it says that who all are required to maintain books of accounts. If you remember, we have to make two groups. The people who are carrying business or profession. First of all, we will make one group of notified professionals. Here, notified professional includes the, the person who is carrying a medical profession like doctor or if the person is carrying legal profession, that is lawyers, accounting profession, chartered accountant, cost accountant and company secretary, film artist, IT professionals. So these all are notified professions. So first of all, we all the people who are carrying business and profession, first of all, we will ask that who all are carrying notified profession. We will make one group of notified professionals. And we will say that you have to maintain books of accounts. It is compulsory for them to maintain books of accounts. Plus, we will give them one more condition. If that condition is satisfied, they have to maintain prescribed books of accounts. I am again repeating. These notified professions, these notified professions, legal profession, medical profession, engineering, architect, accounting, cost accountant, chartered accountant, technical consultancy, interior decorator, film artist, company secretary, ID professional, authorized representative. Right? These people have to maintain books of accounts. These people have to maintain books of accounts. And if their gross receipts of last three years for each year, if it is more than 1.5 lakh, then they have to maintain prescribed books of accounts. I am again repeating. These notified professions have to maintain books of accounts and if their gross receipts, gross receipts we can say turnover. Generally for professions, we don't use the word turnover, we use gross receipts. So if the gross receipts of last three years is exceed, exceeds for all the three years exceeds 1.5 lakh, then they have to maintain prescribed books of accounts. So it is mentioned, see these notified professions have to maintain, they are required to maintain such books of accounts so that AO can may enable them to compute their income. So that assessing officer, whenever assessing officer wishes, whenever assessing officer want that they would like to calculate their income, they should maintain books of accounts also. And note, if the gross receipts in all three preceding years, preceding year, see our pre previous year is 23-24. So you have to go in last three years. Last three years, if gross receipts is more than 1.5 lakh for all three years, all three years, it is not any, it is all. For all three years, if it is more than 1.5 lakh, then they have to maintain prescribed books of accounts. Second thing is that what is prescribed books of accounts? You understand? It is cash book, general, ledger, easy. Cash book, they have to maintain cash book. They have to maintain general. They have to maintain ledger. They have to keep the carbon copies of the bills issued by them and which is more than 25 rupees, right? Because they must have issued the bills to their customers, right? If I am carrying a notified profession, I will issue a bill. The original bill will go to the customer the client and I'll keep the duplicate copy that's called carbon copy. So any bill which I have issued and it has value of more than rupees 25, I have to keep that also into the records. So carbon copies of the bills issued if it is more than rupees 25 and the original bill received exceeding rupees 50 because the things I have purchased, if I have purchased anything which is of more than 50 rupees, I have to keep that original bill also. And for how many years we have to keep it? You understand for six years we have to keep it. So this is the requirement for notified professions. Now we'll talk to the second group. So tell me who all are there in the second group. Second group contains other professions and as well as business people. The people who are carrying businesses and the person who is uh, not, in uh, no, not in notified professions but other professions are in second group. So all of them combined together, it will be second group. Whether they have to maintain books of accounts, the answer is yes. The answer could be no also. So it depends upon their income. It depends either on their income or it depends in, on their turnover, right? So these notified professions, they have to maintain books of accounts. And if this 1.5 lakh condition is satisfied, they have to maintain prescribed books of accounts. But this other group, although they are not required to maintain books of accounts, but if the income exceeds up to a certain limit or their turnover exceeds a certain limit, then they are required to maintain books of accounts. Otherwise, 
if neither the income condition is satisfied nor the turnover condition is satisfied they are not required to maintain any books of accounts are you all getting this so it is written over here person carrying business or other profession this is my second group i am talking about other than notified which professions they are carrying which is other than notified professions such persons are required to maintain books of accounts if if either of the condition either the income criteria or the turnover criteria is, is satisfied then they have to re uh, require then they are required to maintain books of accounts otherwise no requirement is such either the income from business or profession or turnover or gross receipts of any of the three preceding year of any of the three please here in notified professions i have discussed in all the three years it should exceed 1.5 lakh but for other professions and uh, all the businesses we are saying if any of the three preceding year either the income exceeds or the turnover exceeds so if the income from business or turnover the gross uh, receipts uh, we can say turnover or we can say for professions we can say gross receipts either of the criteria is satisfied that you have to maintain books of accounts so for individual and hgf you must have uh, you must know that for individual and hgf we have different limit and for other ssc we have different limit for individual and HUF, if the income exceeds 2.5 lakh, if any, if even if of any of the pre previous year, any of the preceding previous year, of uh, we will see the last three years. In, in if in any case the income of the individual or HUF is more than 2.5 lakh, they are required to maintain books of accounts. Or their turnover is more than 25 lakh, they are required to maintain books of accounts. If the assessee is other than individual or HUF, so in this case, if the it is the case of other assessee, if their income exceeds 1.2 lakh in any of the three preceding year, in any of the three preceding years, or their turnover exceeds 10 lakh rupees, then they are required to maintain books of accounts, right? Either the income exceeds or the turnover exceeds this limit, then they are required to maintain books of accounts. Otherwise, it is not required. If any of the condition does not get satisfied neither the income criteria nor the turnover criteria does not get satisfied then they are not required to maintain books of accounts correct let's say but if it is a new business if it is a new business then we will ask if your income or your turnover is likely to exceed this limit then they are required to maintain books of accounts also right so in case of in case of new business if the income or turnover of the preceding year likely to exceed the above limit is this likely to exceed the above limit in case of new businesses or new profession then they are required to maintain books of accounts and for how many years they have to preserve these all the accounts which we have just discussed they have to preserve it for six years this six year is important it can come in your mcq the six year is important okay and books must be kept at the place of business or profession wherever you are carrying your business wherever you are carrying your profession you have to keep the books of accounts over there and let's say if you have multiple places of business let's say i have a business in chennai i have a business in bangalore i have a business somewhere else then where i should keep my books of accounts at the principal place of business so whatever is the your main place of business your head office is there your corporate office is there you have to maintain books of accounts over there so in case of more than one place at principal place of business you have to keep the books of accounts and another important point which can come in an examination that if this let's say i was satisfying the criteria that i have to maintain books of accounts but still if i am not i fail to maintain the books of accounts I was uh, I was uh, satisfying the income criteria or I was satisfying the turnover criteria but still if I am not maintained books of accounts so is there any penalty the answer is yes there is a penalty of rupees 25,000 so if you do not follow the uh, provisions of section 44 AA there would be a penalty of rupees 25,000 in this case right 44 AA is an important section second is again an important section 44 AB tax audit again in fact, I would say this is much more important than 44 double. 44 double was also important, but this is again much, this has, this is quite a more important section than 44 double. You should know about 44 AB because this is directly related to chartered account. This is directly related to chartered account because chartered accountant are the one 
person who does this text audit. So whether we we now know that who all are required to maintain books of accounts, whether they are required to get their text audit done also by a chartered accountant, the answer could be yes. It depends upon their turnover. It depends in profession. We can say it depends on their gross receipts. So for this, we will again form two groups. But now all professions, please understand for text audit for section 44 AB, we will form two groups. Now all the professions, not uh, notified, all the professions, all the professions will be kept in one group and all the businesses, all businesses will be, uh, will be, will be clubbed together under second group, right? All professions, one, all businesses, another. So first of all, let me talk about profession. So if their gross receipts of the previous year, of the previous year, we are doing previous year 23-24, this year, we have to do the audit for this previous year, right? We obviously, we will do it in assessment year. But we will look at the turnover of this previous year only. Please do not go back. In section 44 AA, in section, uh, in section 44 AA, we have seen your turnover. We have seen your income of the preceding years. But for this 44 AB, please remember this point. You have to see the turnover or you, in case of profession, you have to see the gross receipts of this previous year only. So if the gross receipts during the previous year exceeds 50 lakh for professionals they are supposed to get their books of accounts audited by a practicing chartered accountant and they have to get it books of accounts audited also and they have to submit the tax audit report also and you understand do you remember when this tax audit report should be submitted to the income tax department one month before the due date of roi let's say obviously if they are getting their accounts audited we will know we will see in our ROI chapter also that they have to uh, file their return up to 31st of October of assessment year. For them, it will be 31st October. But they, if they are required to get their tax audit done also, in that case, they have to submit their, actually their chartered accountant will submit this tax audit report. It should be furnished one month before the due date of ROI. So 31st October is the due date of ROI for them. And one month if I'll go prior to it, it will be 30th of September. So by 30th of September, this tax audit report should be furnished to the income tax department. So here, if professional are required to get their books of accounts audited, if their gross receipts exceed 50 lakh during the previous year. Here, this is important. Here, this is important. Here, the question can come in your examination for businesses. Our businesses are also required to get their books of accounts audited. The answer is yes. If their turnover, this is something which is very important. If their turnover exceeds 1 crore during the previous year, first of all, 1 crore. If their turnover exceeds rupees 1 crore, then they are required to get their books of accounts audited. But wait. If you deal mostly in, if you deal mostly in banking transactions, whatever you receive, you receive through a banking channel, through an EFT, through account paycheck or account pay demand draft, whatever you receive, you receive through banking channel, whatever you make payment, you make through banking mode. That is mostly you use only banking mode while purchasing anything, while making any payment or for receiving anything also. So if mostly your banking, if your all the transactions are through banking mode, then you are not required to get your books of accounts audited unless and until your turnover exceeds 10 crore. See, a major variation is there. Generally, businesses are required to get their books of accounts audited if they are, generally speaking, if their turnover exceeds 1 crore. But if majorly there are banking transactions, you just negligible amount uh, uh, you accept or you pay through cash or bearer check or cross check otherwise everything all the transactions which are happening are through banking mode then your turnover if it exceeds 10 crore then you are required to get your books of accounts audit so here it is mentioned that if the turn turnover of gross receipts during the previous year exceeds 1 crore then they are required to get their books of accounts audited but if all cash receipts and all payments in cash 
कैश इज अलाउड बट नेग्लिजिबल हाउ मच फाइव परसेंट इफ यू हैव मेड द पेमेंट्स इन कैश बट वेरी नेग्लिजिबल हाउ मच मैक्सिम फाइव परसेंट नाइनटी फाइव परसेंट आर थ्रू बैंकिंग मोड only up till 5% or 4% 3% 5% is maximum guys right if let's say i have made the cash payment the entire year the cash payment which uh, the entire year the total payment which we have made if i have made 6% in cash no then 10 crore will not be applied it will only be 1 crore in that case so for the people who are doing entire transactions mostly through banking mode for them 10 crore would be applicable in this case so all receipts in cash does not exceed 5% of turnover and all payments in cash does not exceed 5% of your total payments the total payment if you have paid it does not exceed maximum cash payment which you have done it is not not more than 5% both the limit should be satisfied not only the cash receipt but the cash payment also that is all the transactions whatever you have received maximum 5% is only allowed in cash right whenever i say cash it also includes bearer check and cross check not account pay account pay is banking mode right so this was important this is something which is very important and assessi opting for presumptive scheme they are not required to get their books of accounts audited i'll tell you uh, once i'll start with this uh, today only we'll do this section 44 ad 44 ada 44a what is presumptive scheme so in that case if the person is following presumptive scheme so he is not required that person is not required to maintain any books of accounts or get get the accounts audited also okay an audit should be done by a chartered accountant a practicing chartered accountant and i have already told you this audit report should be furnished before one month before the due date that is the due date would be 31st october in your case because you have to get your books of accounts audited it so it should be one year before that is 30 sorry one month before that is 30th of september okay this is again important see if you are already uh, liable to get your books of accounts audited under any other law apart from income tax act let's say if a business or profession you are required to get your books of accounts audited under any other law then you are required then is it is required that you should do uh, you should, you have to do uh, that get the tax audit done also no then it is not required if you are required to get the books of accounts audited under any other law then tax audit is not not required just a simple uh, written uh, simple statement will be furnished in that case so if audit is conducted under any other law then tax audit is not required only a report to be submitted and penalty for see i have discussed the penalty of 25000 in case of books of accounts but here tax audit penalty is a bit more it is 0.5% of your sales or gross receipts whatever if it is business it sales if it is profession it is it would be gross receipts so 0.5% of your sales or gross receipts or 150000 whichever is lower whichever is lower this is the penalty for section 44 ab this is penalty is again important you should know this penalty please i would request you to please learn this amount so if you are not following section 44 ab you are required to get your books of accounts audited and if you are not following this particular thing this provision then income tax will uh, levy a penalty on you that would be 0.5% of your gross receipts or your turnover as the case may be or 150000 whichever is lower right okay so this was about section 44 ea and 44 ab important now come to the presumptive income computation okay let me discuss about uh, this presumptive income computation we have three sections in our syllabus on presumptive basis that is 44 ad 44 ada and 44 ae once we'll reach uh, nca final very soon then we have some more sections there 44 b b b double b b b a etc but right now in our ca intermediate we have three sections 44 ad 44 a and 44 ad first of all just understand the logic behind these sections these sections are for those assessees for those assessee who are carrying business or profession who don't do not have a very large business who do not have a very large business so these sections are primarily meant for the assessee who are carrying their business or who are carrying their profession and that is not on a very large scale they have right now they have a small business or a small profession right first some rule is this 
this is not these sections are not for companies and all these are majorly you will see that these sections are only for individual SSC or HUF and to some extent to partnership firm also and they will exclude LLP right so they will exclude LLP they will exclude company so these section I am saying I am referring to that these sections the primary the thumb rule is that these sections are only for small SSCs right they can compute their presumptive income if I tell you about 44 AD 44 ADA is for the SSC who are carrying notified professions. We have just discussed notified, what are notified professions, who all are covered in under notified professions. We have just discussed in section 44 AA. Who are they? Person who is carrying legal profession, person who is carrying medical profession, that is doctor, accounting, chartered accountant, cost accountant, company secretary, interior decorator, film artist. So these are notified professions. For them, we have a special section 44 ADA if a person is carrying notified profession then they can come under this section 44 A 44 A is for such kinds of assessee who are carrying business of plying hiring leasing of good carriage vehicle but they don't have if they have more than 10 goods vehicle then we will say that you are carrying a large business then it is not allowed so the thumb rule is that only for small businesses here we will see in 44 A we will see that the limit is if you are owning not more than 10 vehicles, then you are allowed to come under this section and you can compute your income on presumptive basis. In 44 AD and 44 AD, we have a threshold of turnover. If you have, if your turnover is not more than that limit, then you can come under this section. But if your turnover is more, that is you have a large business, then you are not allowed over here. Right. So the thumb rule is that these, all these three sections are only for those assessee whose scale of business is not that large. They are carrying a small business, correct? And second thing we understand that these are, this is presumptive income sections that we will assume your income on the basis of certain parameters. Generally, it is on the basis of your turnover. We will assume your income and the normal provisions will not apply to you. If you would like to opt this section, because these are optional sections. If you would like to opt for these section, then normal provisions will not apply to you, right? Next important thing is that there are some heavy deductions in income tax. There are some heavy deductions like 10 AA, SEZ deduction is there. So if you, if an SSE is claiming deduction under section, section 10 AA, it means that he is carrying a large level business. So those people are not allowed to uh, get uh, the this facility of these presumptive income sections. So again and again, I am saying the criteria is that you are carrying not that large business. If you are claiming deduction under sec uh, section 10A, 10 AA, SEZ, etc. Or under, uh, the, although these sections are not in your syllabus, but there are some sections like 80I, IA, IB, IC, etc. which you will learn in your final level. Because these are quite heavy deductions. These are quite heavy deductions. So if you are claiming deductions under those sections, then also you will not be allowed to come over here because these deductions are quite heavy. So these deductions are part of chapter 6 say that is 80C to 80U but we are not referring to that all these deductions. You can claim some of the deduction but those deductions which fall under chapter 6 say heading C. In heading C we have some deductions. Most of them are not in our syllabus but heading C only includes deductions starting from 80I. 80C, 80D, 80E etc are not in heading C. Heading C starts from 80I till 80 RRB, although some of the deductions are there in our syllabus like QQB and RRB. But otherwise, I tell you, these are in heading C, these are these are profit link deductions and these are quite heavy deductions. So the, the main base is that that if you are claiming those heavy deductions, you cannot come in this sections. So my primary motive is to explain you that these type of sections for presumptive scheme is only for small assessors. It is not for large scale businesses. Okay. First of all, let me discuss 44 AD. 44 AD says that you can compute if you are eligible to come in this section, then you can compute your income on notional basis. That's called deemed basis. You can come and yes, normal provisions will not apply. Normal provision will not apply. This section overrides these provisions. So you don't have to follow the normal provisions. You do not need to uh, uh, compute your 
computer depreciation as per section 32 you will not give you specifically any deduction under section 35 that is scientific research we will not give you any other deduction which we have seen in section 36 37 no normal provisions will not apply we will assume your income on some deemed basis on some assumption basis okay next is that which type of assessee are eligible for 4480 See, as I have already discussed that these assessees are assessees who are not carrying their business on a very large level. So they have specifically mentioned if you would like to come in 44AD, then assessee must be an individual. That person can be an HUF or a partnership firm. Even LLP is not covered over here. If any LLP, this is important. This can come in our examination. If LLP, Limited Liability Partnership, we understand that it is also part of partnership. But if LLP would like to get, uh, would like to cal compute their income on presumptive basis, is it allowed? The answer is no. LLP is not allowed. Only individual is allowed, HUF is allowed, or partnership firm, normal partnership firm, not LLP. Second important thing is that only resident SSC. Let's say if there is an individual who is non resident, that non resident says, sir, I would like to come under this section 44AD and I would like to compute my income on presumptive basis. No, you are not allowed. So only resident assessee are allowed that to individual HUF, normal partnership firm, not LLP. Individual HUF partnership firm are allowed excluding LLP and only resident assessees are covered over here. Next important thing is that if they provided you do not claim heavy deductions, which are there in section 10A, 10AA, Heading C of chapter 6, not entire chapter 6, because entire chapter 6 is from 80C to 80U. We are only excluding heading C. Heading C of chapter 6 starts from 80I to 80RRB. If you are claiming deductions under these sections, most of the sections are not in our syllabus, so we have not heard about it. But yes, QQB and RRB, we know that. Royalty on books and RRB's patents other than books. But yes, these 80 I series are very heavy deductions. So if you are claiming these deductions, no, you are not allowed. You are a large SSC then, right? You got this point? You should know this because here in this sections in 44 AD and 44 ADA, there is an amendment also. At any given point of time, these sections are important. At any given point of time, these sections are important. But because of this amendment, these sections become super important now, right? For your 2024 examinations, this section will uh, is uh, not super important, and I expect that question will uh, examiner will ask you on these topics, at least in MCQ. Okay, what is the amendment? I'll tell you. Okay, who are not eligible? See, we already know there is a section 44 ADA. There is a section 44 ADA where, where notified professions are eligible. So can notified professions can come in this section? No, sir, because we have a specific section for notified professions. Why they are coming here? So in 44 AD, AD, notified professions cannot come because we have a specific sections for them. Similarly, people who are carrying a uh, business of flying, hiring, leasing of goods, carriage vehicle, we have already have a section 44 A. Why boss you are coming in this section? No, you are not allowed. Gates are closed. Okay, so people who are already covered under these sections cannot come in this section. Please, you have a separate section. Please go over there. You calculate your presumptive income, uh, income as per that provision, right? So those people are not eligible. First thing first, EC. So who are not eligible? Person carrying notified professions are not eligible, which are notified because we have a section 44 ADA there. And where are they notified? Sir, we have seen, I have taken the reference of notified first time in the sec in which section 44 AA when we are uh, looking at that section maintenance of books of account. So in, these notified professions are mentioned in 44 AA. So it is written over here that those notified professions who are mentioned in 44 AA, they are not allowed to compute their presumptive income under this section 44 AD because we have a special section for them, which is 44 AD, correct? Second is easy, person who are carrying a business of flying, hiring, leasing of goods, carriage vehicle, boss, we have a separate section for you. Why we would like to come over here? No, sorry, gate is closed for you. Okay. Next is person who are carrying agency business, a person who are earning income in the nature of commission or brokerage. Commission or brokerage, if you are earning income or you are carrying an agency business, then also you are not allowed 
to compute your presumptive income as per this section. Why, sir? Why it is there? Why not for them? Because see, the person who is carrying agency business, a person who is carrying a uh, business on commission basis, so their commission is just one person, two person. This is what their income is. Here, I'll I'll tell you in presumptive scheme how we'll cal calculate our income. Whatever our turnover is. We divide our turnover into two parts. Whatever the amount which we have received through cash, we calculate 8% on that. Whatever the amount which we have collected through banking mode, we, we say 6% on that. So minimum is 6%. Here, the pres in presumptive scheme, the minimum amount which we'll be computing is 6% on your turnover. But these agency business, this commission or brokerage business, they are generally having income. They have just 0.5%, 1%, 2%. They work on this much profit. So that is the reason they cannot come under this section. So they have specifically mentioned that person who are carrying agency business, person who are carrying agency business or person earning income in the nature of commission or brokerage are not allowed over here. Clear? Right? Here is the amendment. In last point, there is an amendment. Previously, the last year, it was that if your turnover does not exceed 2 crore, then you can come under this section. So if the turnover of the pre of the previous year, previous year for our for us, the previous year is 23-24. So if the turnover of the previous year does not exceed 2 crore, then you can come. I have already mentioned that small businesses are allowed. So if you have a turnover of more than 2 crore, you are not allowed. But there is an amendment. Now this 2 crore limit is increased to 3 crore answer is yes also no also why because now there are two limits two crore also is there three crore also is there we have to see both of them first of all we have to identify which limit we should apply now there is one more limit now that is three crore two crore is still there i am saying two crore is still there now by this amendment a one more limit is added to this section that is three crore and very beautifully they have added it they have said that if majorly your receipts, majorly your receipts are if they are through banking mode, if they are through banking channel, you receive from your customers, you receive it through by account pay check, account pay bank draft or your NEFT, RTGS, UPI, then we will increase your threshold limit to 3 crores, right? 2 crore is also there, but we are giving you an advantage. If you receive all uh, your receipts, if you receive all your turnover, that in banking mode, majorly it is banking mode. How much is allowed in cash mode? Only maximum 5%. Maximum 5% is only through cash. Otherwise, whatever you receive from your customer, it is through banking mode, account pay check, account paying bank draft, your NEFT, RTGS, UPA, etc. Then we are increasing your limit to 3 crores. So tell me. If there is a person, if there is a person, let's say he's an individual and he's carrying a business, he's carrying a business and his turnover is 2.6 crore, 2.6 crore, whether tell me whether this person is eligible under section 44 AD or not, sir, it depends upon how he has collected the amount, how he has collected the amount from his customer. If it is majorly through banking mode, that is through, it was there little bit of it of the turnover was through cash otherwise majorly it is through banking mode then yes this person is elig eligible because now the limit for that person would be three crores but if you will tell me sir majorly he accepts through cash his turnover whatever the turnover of the previous year was majorly he has accepted that turnover through cash in that case we will say no he is not allowed because for him the limit would be two crores got it so now the limit under section 44 AD is 2 crore also, 3 crore also. It depends upon their turnover, how they are receiving this turnover, right? In, please remember that when I was discussing 44 AB audit, I was discussing receipts also and payment also. Both the things you have to see. But here only you have to see the receipts, only the turnover which, which you have to see. Because why? Because here, and this is quite logical also, we will not see the payment, we will see only the receipts. Why? Because this is very logical. If you will just uh, apply your brains, then you will be able to know that 
हेयर योर प्रिजम्टिव इनकम डिपेंड्स अपॉन योर टर्न ओवर हेयर योर प्रिजम्टिव इनकम डिपेंड्स अपॉन योर टर्न ओवर सो टर्न ओवर इज नथिंग इज टर्न ओवर इज योर पेमेंट्स और रिसेट्स इट इज रिसेट्स so that is the reason we will see only receipts over here we will not see any payment if you have made the payment in cash it's okay with us but here we are just discussing about receipts so if your receipts are majorly through banking mode only maximum 5% is cash 3% 4% maximum 5% is in cash otherwise 95% is through banking mode then we will apply 3 crore on you otherwise 2 crore right So any business where turnover of the previous year exceeds three crore, but if the aggregate of cash received during the previous year exceeds five percent, then we will apply two crore, right? Okay. So we got it. Now we know that when two crore will be applied, uh, will be applicable, and we understand when this three crore limit will come into picture. Okay. How we will compute the presumptive income, sir? The thing is that. Whatever your turnover is, divide that turnover into two parts. First of all, tell me how much you have received through banking mode. How much you have received through banking mode, right? And on that banking mode, you will apply six percent. Minimum six percent. If you would like to apply more, then it is okay. But minimum six percent on that turnover will become your income. And whatever the remaining amount is, apply eight percent on that. You will get your income. You will get your presumptive income. Right. One more important thing that about six percent is that whatever you have received through banking mode up to the due date of ROI, this is important. Whatever you have received through banking mode up to the due date of ROI, in that case we have to apply six percent, and for others we have to apply eight percent. See, it is written over there. How much will be the presumptive income? How you will be determining your presumptive income? A specified percentage of turnover gross receipts depends upon the mode of receipts. How much you have received, we will apply six percent. We can also apply eight percent. But first six percent. If you have received through banking mode, that is through account pay check, account pay DD, e transfer, U pay, etc. That is through banking channel. If you have received it, that too before on or before the due date of ROI. On or before the due date of ROI, we will whatever your turnover is. Whatever the, which you have received up to the due date of ROI through banking mode, we will apply six percent on that, and on remaining we will apply eight percent. So this will become your presumptive income. If someone tells you, if SSE tells you, sir, if can I apply more? Can can I assume my income more than six percent, more than eight percent? Also, that is okay. You are welcome. Six percent and eight percent is the minimum. Is the minimum percentages. If someone would like to pay more taxes, it's his wish, right? Although no one, nobody will pay, but still, if somebody would like to pay more taxes, there might be circumstances that he would like to pay more taxes. He would like to show his income more than this limit also. Then there is no problem. But if you would like to show your income less than six percent or less than eight percent, then we will restrict you. Then we will restrict you, right? But it should be minimum. Uh, it should be minimum six percent or eight percent. I'll tell you with this example also, and these examples are very important now. Because due to this amendment, if you come to this is page number five point two eight. So if you come to this page five point two eight, there are some examples written over there, and these are very important. Please mark them important, very important. In fact, it says. The following assessees are carrying retail businesses. Okay, determine whether they are eligible for presumptive income. First of all, you have to determine whether they are eligible for forty-four AD or they are not eligible. Okay, if yes, if they are eligible, then you have to calculate their presumptive income. Also, very important question. This type of question, I am expecting that examiner will ask you this time. Okay, first of all, tell me. Mr. A has total sales of one sixty lakh. One sixty lakh is not even more than two crore. Do we require to see how much he has uh, received in cash or in um, to other mode for applying, determining whether three crore limit will apply, two crore limit will apply? Answer is no, sir. If his turnover is not more than two crore, then we will simply say yes, he is allowed. Because if the turnover is more than two crore, then we will see whether the cash. 
receipt the received uh, he has made during the year the received which he has taken receipt which he has taken whether it was in cash mode or banking mode then we have to see but if it is not more than two crore we are okay we will simply say yes sir that person is allowed to opt for for this section so this person is obviously allowed because his receipts is more not more than two crores okay okay now we have to calculate the answer is yes because his turnover does not exceed two crore he is eligible and this person is individual also and we will assume if nothing is mentioned we always assume that the person is a resident ssc okay now tell me how much would be the presumptive it depends it depends now that how much he has received through banking mode up to the due date of roi for that we will take 6% and for remaining we will take 8% so here it is mentioned that received through banking mode up to the due date of roi is 60 lakh and remaining is 100 lakh okay so for 160 lakh we will do two we will split this into two part one is 60 lakh this is through banking mode which he has received that to up to the due date of roi this is important up to the due date of roi okay 60 lakh and the remaining is 100 lakh so on 60 lakh apply 6% that is 3.6 lakh and on 100 lakh apply 8% that would be 8 lakh So three point six plus eight, it will become eleven point six lakh. Is their presumptive income? See, I have all already mentioned here as well. So if you will see, since the turnover of Mister A is not more than two crore, the assessee is eligible for presumptive income, right? And how much would be the presumptive income over here? So up to the due date of ROI, he has received through banking mode sixty lakh, and for others it is hundred lakh. On sixty lakh, we will do six percent. On hundred lakh, we will do eight percent. So this is the total amount. Eleven point six lakh will become his presumptive income. Will become his presumptive income. Second, for Mr. B, Mr. B has turnover of two forty lakh. Can I simply say yes? He is eligible. No, I cannot simply say. First of all, I have to analyze how much he has received through banking mode. And how much he has received through cash or bearer check or cross check, right? Because cash, bearer check, and cross check are also as good as cash, right? Okay. So tell me how much he has received through banking mode and how much is through others. So out of two forty lakh, two hundred lakh he has received through banking mode, okay, and forty lakh he has received through cash, okay. Tell me how much is the percentage, sir? Forty lakh is through cash. It should not be more than five percent, right? Okay. Sir, forty lakh is cash. Total turnover is two forty. Tell me how much it is percentage. How much it is forty divided by two forty is sixteen point six six seven percent. This is the cash. No, sir. He is not allowed. Why? Because for him the limit would be only two crore. Why? Because sir, three crore is only for those people who are majorly accepting through banking mode. Maximum it should be ninety five percent, right? Minimum it should be ninety five percent. Your cash maximum should not go beyond five percent, right? But here your cash is going sixteen point six seven percent, sir. Only two crore limit would be applied, Mister B, on you. So, Mister B, you are not eligible to come under presumptive basis. This is the question which examiner can ask you, right? Please mark this important, and I believe that you got this also. So turnover of Mr. B is more than two crore, however less than three crore. Although it was business, his turnover was more than two crore, but less than three crore. Still, we will see how much is the percentage of cash. So the percentage of cash received is sixteen point six seven percent. We have just calculated. That is the reason we will say no. Three crore limit will not be applied to him. Only two crore limit will apply to him, and since his turnover is exceeding two crore. You will be able to write this, right? Please write this in simple, plain English. That since his turnover is more than two crore, and for him three crore limit will not apply, as is the percentage of cash received is more than five percent. Sorry, we are not going to allow you. Okay. Let us understand Mr. C's point. Mr. C has a turnover of two ninety lakh during the year. Okay. Tell me how much is the cash? Through banking mode, it is two eighty and cash is ten lakh. Okay, just apply that percentage because it is more than two crore. Okay, ten lakh is cash. 
total is 290 total is 290 right 10 upon 290 percent so it would be 10 divided by 290 it is 3.44 percent this is not more than see i have done 10 lakh divided by total turnover is 290 lakh into 100 it is giving me 3.44 percent that is not more than 5 percent so mr c your turnover is although exceeding 2 crore but for you we will give you 3 crore limit why because majorly whatever you ex uh, accept during the year it was through banking mode so it was very la less in cash so boss you are you are welcome to come in the section 44 ad yes you can come if yes how much would be the income how much is the presumptive income sir whatever the amount which he has received through banking mode up to the due date of roi apply six percent on that on remaining apply eight percent okay so out of 290 we will split this into two parts 290 will split into two parts one is how much he has received through banking mode 280 lakh and remaining is 10 lakh on 280 lakh apply six percent on on 10 lakh apply eight percent i have given the calculations also uh, see here it is mentioned that presumptive income received through banking mode 286 percent and remaining 10 lakh 8 percent so this is 16.8 and 80,000 here 10 lakh into 8 percent is 80,000 16.8 right you are able to see presumptive income is 17.6 lakh got it okay and the last is let's discuss about mr d so mr d has total sales of 310 lakh he has total sales of 310 lakh whether he is allowed simply no why sir anyways his turnover is more than three crores so how he is allowed he is uh, carrying a large business sir he is not allowed because we understand presumptive sections are only for small businesses it is not for you you are, we are not going to allow you sorry so this person will not be allowed so only in our case a was allowed and c was allowed we have not allowed b why we have not allowed b his turnover is not more than three crores sir but his cash receipts are more than five percent that is the reason we have not allowed him and for d we have not allowed him because his turnover is sir anyways more than three crores sorry we are not going to allow that person okay so this was 44 ad and there are some common points also in all these three sections let me discuss that as well come back this is page number 5.24 this is page number 5.24 right come back other important conditions or notes regarding section 44 AD. see we understand there would be no further deduction because we are not calculating income as per normal provisions now we are calculating income on presumptive basis so if we are calculating your income on presumptive basis normal provisions will not apply to him we will assume that the effect has already been given so can assessee say that sir can I compute depreciation on my assets under section 32? The answer is no, sir. It will be deemed as if the depreciation effect has been given. We will not give it actually, but we will deem it. It will be assumed that the depreciation effect has already been given. All sections effect has already been given, right? And so we will not be calculating. Please uh, remember this thing. We will not be calculating the actual depreciation, but it will be assumed that depreciation etc other expenses are are deemed to be given right so let's say i give you an example let's say assessee has purchased a machine of rupees 10 lakh and of rupees 10 lakh and he is claiming uh section 44 ad uh, uh, he is computing his income as per section 44 ad presum presumptive income so second year how much is the value of the machine will it remain 10 lakh again no it will be deemed as if the depreciation effect has been given so first year, second year, third year, let's say in fourth year, now his turnover is exceeding, is exceeded a three crore or four uh, or two crore as the case may be. Now in fourth year or fifth year, he will be computing his income as per normal provision. So what value will, will it take of his machine or any other asset? It will be, uh, he will take that depreciated value, right? So it will be deemed as if the effect of depreciation has already been given, correct? So this is something which is written over here. So no further deduction is allowed under section 3238 
assessee cannot claim unabsorbed appreciation from such presumptive income you cannot claim unabsorbed this is the point which i have to discuss quite important because sometimes it happens examiner can ask you let's say assessee is computing their income on presumptive basis and for last year there were brought forward business losses also and brought forward depreciation also so can we claim can we set off those brought forward losses or brought forward unabsorbed depreciation from this presumptive income the answer is if it is unabsorbed depreciation it will not be allowed why because we understand unabsorbed depreciation is part of section 32 right and we know that if we are following presumptive basis computation we understand we always assume that the effect of section 28 to 43 has already been given because unabsorbed depreciation is part of section 32 we will not give it separately we will assume that it has already been given so can again i am asking you the question if in this year assessee is computing their income on presumptive basis whether they can set off unabsorbed depreciation of last year from this income the answer is no because unabsorbed depreciation is part of section 32 and 32 effect has already been given so we are not going to give you any deduction of unabsorbed depreciation which are of last year what about business losses we know that we have a chapter of set off and carry forward of losses and we understand that the set off and carry forward of losses uh, comes under section 70 to 80 70 to 80 from 70 to 80 these sections are from 70 to 80 right so when when we calculate our income on presumptive basis when we calculate our income on presumptive basis we assume that the effect of section 28 to 43 c has already been given right 28 to 43 has already been given not of section 70 to 80 so that is the reason if you are calculated, this is something important. Examiner might ask you this question, uh, specifically in MCQ. So, if assessee is computing in this previous year, assessee is computing their income on presumptive basis, and if last year brought forward losses are coming, can we set off from this presumptive income? Yes, we can set off because they are not part of section 28 to 43. They are part of section 70 to 80, boss. They are part of 70 to 80. So that is the reason we can set it off, right? So unabsorbed depreciation of last year? No. Brought forward losses of last year? Yes. Okay. Assessee cannot claim unabsorbed depreciation from such presumptive income. However, brought forward losses can be set off. I have already discussed this with you. The value of asset shall be written down as if deemed depreciation is provided. What did we discuss? If assessee is partnership firm, this is again important. If assessee is a partnership firm, can partnership firm can come under section 44 AD? Yes, sir. If it is a normal partnership firm, they can come. If it is LLP, no. Okay. Let's say it's a normal partnership firm. We have done section 40 small b also. Section 40 b is remuneration to partners. We can give remuneration to partners also. Can remuneration of partners be allowed from this presumptive income? The answer is no, not from 4480. Also, not from 44 ADA, but from 44 AE we can give. AE we can give, but for from 44 AD, ADA not allowed. So it is not allowed. Right. And if you are computing your income on presumptive basis, then you are not required to maintain your books of accounts. You are not required to get your accounts audited also. Both these things are not required for you. We, we are, uh, I have already um, uh, given this reference when I was uh, doing this 44 double and 44 AB with you. And now you understand because this person is a small businessman or a carrying small profession. In that case, they are not required to get their books of accounts audited. Or they are not required to maintain their books of accounts. Right. But last point in this last point, it is written that if assessee was computing their income on presumptive basis. But after some year, they now switch to normal scheme. If they now switch to normal scheme due to any reason, like it could be that their turnover is now exceeding that limit. That is the reason they are now switching it to normal scheme. So once you switch to your normal scheme for next five years, you cannot come back in 4480. For next five years, you cannot come back to 4480 
and also once you switch to your normal scheme you have to maintain your books of accounts also and you have to get them audited as well okay so in case the assessee has opted in case the assessee has opted presumptive computation in any earlier previous year and now shifting to normal provisions such as assessee cannot follow presumptive scheme again for give me a Here you can see. In case assessee has opted presumptive computation in any earlier previous year, and now shifting to and now shifting to normal provisions, such assessee cannot follow presumptive scheme again for next five years. Next five years you cannot come back, right? Next five years you cannot come back. Plus, you are required to maintain books of accounts and undergo audit in those five years. Provided his income exceeds the basic exemption limit. If your income exceeds the basic exemption limit, then you have to get your books of accounts audited also and get them. Uh, you have to maintain your books of accounts and you have to get them audited as well. Okay. Okay, one more point about advanced tax obligations. We understand, although, although we have not done the revision so far of advanced tax, I'll do with the TDS and the TCS and then we'll do advanced tax also. But we know we have already read it once, right? I believe that you have already read your income tax once. So we know that there are four dates, four quarterly statements are uh, four quarterly dates are there, are there where, where you have to make your advanced tax payment. One is 15th of, do you remember those dates? 15th of June, second installment is on 15th of September, 15th December, and then 15th of March, right? So normally assessee has to pay their advance tax in four installments, 15th June, first quarter, second is 15th September, 15th December and 15th of uh, March, right? If assessee is following section 44 AD and ADA, I'm again repeating, if the assessee is computing their presumptive income under section 44 AD and also in 44 ADA, then only advanced tax for advanced tax only they have to pay the entire advanced tax not on first not on second not on third only on the last one that is only one date is applicable to them that to the last one 15th of march of the previous year right 15th of march only on the last installment you have to pay the entire amount so for you we are giving you exemptions we are giving you some facility you do not require to pay your advance tax in the first installment second installment third installment you have to pay your entire advance tax in the last installment this is in 44 ad this is also so this, the same provision is to be followed in 44 ada but in 44 a you have to pay for all all four 44 a all four but in these two sections ad and ada only the last installment got it so here it is written Advanced tax obligation, assessee opting for presumptive scheme under section 44 AD and I tell you 44 ADA also same. AD and ADA also same provisions. Have to pay advanced tax by 15th March of the previous year. That is only single installment. They have to pay whatever the advanced tax is, is they have to pay 100% on the last installment. First three installments are not for them. But for 44 A, all three installments are there. Okay. Now, 44 AD. 44 AD is for notified professional. As I've already mentioned, that people who are carrying notified professions, they could be legal profession, medical profession, chartered accountant, cost accountant, company secretary, film artist, interior decorator, right? They can uh, follow 44 AD A provided. Okay, tell me uh, in 44 AD, the last section which we did just now, eligible assessee was individual, HUF, and partnership firm but not LLP in 4480. Here the eligible SSE is individual and normal partnership firm excluding LLP. Sir, why HUF is not there? Apply your logic, boss. See, these are profession. HUF cannot carry profession. Can HUF be a chartered accountant firm? No. It a CA can either be an individual or it could be a firm of chartered accountants, right? So you don't have to learn all these things. You just apply your logic. This is something which is very interesting, right? So you have to just apply your logic. So some people will, uh, some students will do, they will do a rectification. They will just mug up all these things. No, there's no need to mug up. Please apply your logic. See, eligible assessee is only individual and partnership firm, excluding LLP, of course. 
and those who are resident. So why HUF is not there? HUF cannot carry any notified profession, right? It's only an individual can carry or a partnership firm can carry, right? Okay. And companies etc. are not covered, right? Because this is for a small SSEs. So we understand who are these notified profession that is already covered. What HUF is not covered, you know why. Eligible SSE. Again, here is also there is a similar type of amendment. Similar type of amendment is here as well. Very, very important from your examination point of view. I am saying that I am expecting in this 2024 examinations, May or November, that this can be asked by the examiner. Earlier, the limit was just 50 lakh. If your gross receipts, gross receipts something same as turnover, but yes, for profession, we call it gross receipts. So if your gross receipts is only up to 50 lakh, not more than 50 lakh, small profession, then you are allowed. Now there is one more limit which has been added. 50 lakh is still there. One more limit of 75 lakh is added. And you know the condition, right? Do you know the condition? Same condition. So whatever the amount which you have received, it should be majorly through banking mode. Only cash is allowed little bit. How much little bit? Maximum 5%. Then we are increasing your limit to 75. So 50 lakh is also there. One more limit is included now, 75 lakh. Easy busy. Okay. So here it is written, any profession, if gross receipts of previous year exceed 75 lakh, but if your cash transactions are more, then we will give, we will restrict to 50 lakh rupees. And you understand that bearer check and cross check are as good as cash, right? Cross check is negotiable because we will not be able to identify in whose account it has gone actually. So it could be if it is through banking mode, banking mode is account pay check, account pay bank draft, NEFT, RTGS, UPI, digital payments, right? But if it is through cash, no. Bearer check, no. Cross check, no. Okay, they are as good as cash. So how much is the presumptive income? 50%, simple 50%. So in the earlier section, we have to see, we have to further see that how much is through banking mode, which is received up to the due date of ROI 6% on remaining it is 8%. But here it is simply 50%. Advanced tax obligation is there? Yes, only one last 31st of March. I have already discussed. And these other provisions are same. It is same as the we have already discussed for 4480. It is you can read it. These are uh, same as before. No other, no change here. Okay. Now come to section 44A. Applying hiring and leasing of goods carriage. Who are eligible? Both resident and it's a bit different from those two. It's a bit different from those two. Here, if it is a partnership firm they can further give, they can further give remuneration to partners from this presumptive income. One difference. Second difference is that here they have to pay all four installments of advance tax. Second difference is here, right? And third difference is that here resident as well as non-resident can come and take the uh, this 44A uh, pre presumptive income computation section. Okay. Eligible SSE is both resident as well as non-resident. Any SAC engaged in the business of plying, hiring, or leasing of goods carriage vehicle. Passenger carriage? No, it is goods carriage vehicle. Right? It should be goods carriage vehicle. This is important. Who owns? Owns, not rented. Owns. How much? Not more than 10 goods vehicle at any time during the previous year. If in any day during the previous year, our previous year is from 20. For, starts from 1st April 23 till 31st of March 2024, right? On any day, if you own 11, 12, 13, that is more than 10 goods vehicle, this section will, you cannot come under this section then. So on any day, it should not be more than 10. It should not be 11. It should not be 12. Maximum, it can be 10. Less than 10, it's okay. But more than 10, is, it's, if it is there, then we are not going to give you uh, this particular section provision. Okay. So how much is the presumptive income? It depends upon if you, if you have a heavy truck, a heavy goods carriage vehicle, or you have a light or medium. So what is the per parameter of heavy goods vehicle or light goods vehicle? 
See for heavy goods vehicle, if the gross vehicle weight is more than 12 tons, 12 tons is 12,000 kg. One ton is equal to 1,000 kg, we understand. So if a vehicle which is more than 12 tons, that is 12,000 kg, it is considered to be a heavy goods vehicle. So any vehicle which is not more than 12,000 kg will be considered as a light good or a medium good vehicle, we can say. Okay. For smaller vehicles, it would be 7,500 per month or part of the month. Presumptive income. This is this is not tax. Boss, this is not tax. This is income. On this income, then you can compute tax. This is presumptive income. Because some people will, some students do this silly mistake. They calculate, they say that this is the tax for them. No, this is not the tax. This is income. I repeat it once again. This is income. It is not tax. Okay. So let's say there is an SMC who has 11 vehicles. Sir, 11? No. He cannot come in 4488. Okay. Let's say there is an SMC who has 10 vehicles. Not more than 10 at any time during the year. Okay. They can come. Let's say he does not have any heavy goods vehicle. All the vehicles are of, let's say, 9,000 kg, 10,000 kg, not more than 12,000 kg. Okay, all are light goods vehicle. So, whatever the vehicle they own, for every month, for every month per vehicle, for every month per vehicle, the presumptive income would be 7,500. Right? Let's say, sir, if he owns a vehicle which is... Uh, for let's say one month and uh, 20 days. So this part of the month will be also be taken as a complete month, right? Part of the month will also be taken as a complete month. So in that case, if he owns a vehicle for two for one, one month and 20 days, we will take it as two months, right? Even if it is one month and one, th one day, even if it is part of the month, even if it is one day, please compute it as a full month. Even in that case also, we will take it as one month, one, one day will be taken as two, right? If it is seven months, five days, eight, right? Any part of the month should be taken as a complete month. So, we will take it as eight months, eight months into 7,500, right? So, for one vehicle per month, presumptive income would be 7,500. And if he is owning that vehicle for part of the month, that part of the month should also be taken as a complete month. Got it? So for light goods vehicle, which is not more than 12,000 kg, 7,500 per month per vehicle, right? Part of the month should be taken as a complete month. If it is a heavy goods vehicle, if it is a heavy goods vehicle, let's say if he owns a vehicle, which is of 15,000 kg. So for every one ton, for every one ton, we take rupees 1,000. For every one ton, we take rupees 1,000. So let's say he has a vehicle of 15 tons then it means 15,000 rupees per month per vehicle. So for every ton, for every ton, we take presumptive income as 1,000. So let's say he has one vehicle of 16,000 kg. So how much would be the presumptive income? 16,000. 16,000 kg, that means 16 tons. For every ton, we have to take 1,000. So 1,000 for per ton or gross vehicle weight. And the same provision will apply over here. If it is part of the month, you should take the complete month, right? Otherwise, everything is same. The only difference is that advanced tax payment, all four payments are there. And if it's a partnership firm, they can give remuneration from this income also. They can give remuneration from this income as well. Right? And uh, advanced tax obligation, all four installments. Otherwise, everything is same. All these things are same. These examples I have already discussed. Okay, now the last part of PGBP, agriculture income. Let's discuss this as well. So we understand that if this agriculture income is earned from India, then only it can be exempt. If it is earned from outside India, please make it IFOS income. So this is something which is asked in your examination that if this agriculture income is coming from, let's say, Australia, from Pakistan, from anywhere outside India, then please make it taxable under IFOS. Only when agriculture income is, uh, is from India, it is from Indian agriculture land, then it is exempt under section 10.1. Okay. Second important thing is that what constitutes agriculture income? See, if there is a farmer, there is a person who cultivates land, 
who does basic operations basic operations means that he uh, just uh, make the soil fertile then he sow the seeds then he uh, do all these cul cultivation and plantation that is called basic operations once the plant grows then this cutting happens so this is called subsequent operations so if a person is doing basic operations also and subsequent operations also then we say that this person is carrying an agriculture activity but if a assessi is engaged only and only in subsequent operations because there are some companies they actually help these farmers once the crop grows they go and they cut it uh, cut them down or they do the harvesting or other things which are called only subsequent operations so if there is this there is an assessi who is involved only in subsequent operations in that case that income is not covered under agriculture income so if assessi is doing both basic as well as subsequent operations agriculture only basic agriculture but only subsequent would be a non agriculture income and that would be taxable normally right second thing is that let me uh, read this first so if it is agriculture income from india then it is exempt if it is earned from outside india it is taxable under ifos please remember this this is something which is very important second thing is that agriculture income includes these things if assessi is just doing basic operations agriculture if person is doing agriculture sorry basic plus subsequent again an agriculture but if assessi performs only subsequent operations it will not be covered under agriculture operations it will be normal business activity and it is normally taxable third point if a person is carrying a nursery business do you understand what is nursery business so there are many people who have shops who have some shops or who have uh, some garden and they uh, give and they sell their plants that is called nursery business i'm not saying kindergarten that nursery no this is the, the nursery the person who is involved in selling those plants there are various kind of flower plants other plants they used to sell this from their shop or from the from their nursery from their garden so if a person is into that particular business that will also be covered under under agriculture operations right so it is again an ex exempt income last thing is that that if let's say i have a land i have a land i am not carrying any agriculture activities on that land but i have given that land to a farmer or to a person who carries who does agriculture activities over there so the rent which he is paying to me the rent which i am receiving although i am not carrying any agriculture activity but i have given my land on rent so if i am receiving a rent of that particular building or, or land in that case which is used for agriculture business that will also be covered under agriculture income so if i am let's say i have my salary income let's say i have my pgvp income by but i also have one more income that is the rent which i am receiving for my land which is used for agriculture business that is again covered under agriculture operations right so here it is mentioned in fourth point that rental income rental income from agriculture land or building used for agriculture purpose this is again an agriculture business this table is very important for you and this is something which is favorite of examiner examiner does ask question on this particular point this is composite income let's say if you are having a business which comprising some of its activities are related to agriculture other activities are related to business in that case how you will segregate how much is my business income and how much is my agriculture income so we have this table and this table is very important you should learn this table and it is quite easy to learn also so here income tax has given that if a person is carrying a rubber business or coffee business or tea business because these are the kind of business which to a certain extent they are agriculture after that they become business let's say the tea business the tea which we we uh, buy from market the tea which we use in our home to make that tea so who makes this tea sir so tata tea makes or there are some other companies who make this uh, tea okay they have gardens they have their tea gardens so they have their employees they have their workers who grow tea for them tea plants for them so that is agriculture activities once 
the tea leaves are plucked from that plant and they we uh, take we carry all these tea leaves from garden to our factory and from here when once these tea are plucked from that garden they are now uh, going to the factory from here my uh, non agriculture activity starts right from here my business activity starts so if i am now selling my tea that is in packets so i am doing my initial basic things of agriculture also and subsequently i am doing non agriculture activities also so in that case the entire income which i have earned i have to segregate that income into a business income and agriculture income so our for these three business for rubber for coffee and for tea it has been mentioned that always you will assume that if it is a rubber business then we will assume 35% will go towards business and 65% is agriculture income so if in your examination there is a question that person is carrying there is an assessee who is carrying a rubber business from that rubber business he earned an income of rupees 10 lakh let's say he has income earned an income of 10 lakh so we will say sir 35% that is 3.5 lakh would be considered as his business income and 65% 6.5 lakh will be considered as his agriculture income right on agriculture income that is an exempt income it will not form part of the total income but only business income will be form part right for coffee coffee we have two percentages so if the person is just engaged the person is just engaged in growing coffee and curing coffee then 25% business and 75% will be considered as an agriculture but if the person is also doing he is also growing curing roasted and grounded also if these two things are all also been done roasted ro uh, roasting of coffee and uh, grounding gr grounding means something which is when you crush the coffee beans so if these things are getting performed then 40% would be related to your business 60% will be related to your agriculture got it i'm again repeating this these are the percentages which you have to learn so if it is a rubber business 35% to will go to business 65 will go to agriculture if it is a coffee business please see what is mentioned in the question if it is only grow and curing of coffee then 25% towards business 75% towards agriculture and if it is roasted or grounded also that is more non agriculture operations are performed then my business income will increase to 40% and agriculture will be 60% and for tea it is again 40 and 60 so for coffee grow cure roasted and grounded and for tea it is same 40% and 60% so one of the method which i can give it to you that whatever is the majority percentage is is given to agriculture operations whatever is the majority percentage see here 35% and 65% what is the majority 65% is given to agriculture here 25 75 majority 75 agriculture 40 60 40 60 majority is given to agriculture operations so you have to learn these percentages but please do remember more income more income is been given to agriculture and less income is coming under business right so for these three business for these three businesses government uh, income tax has given us the rules that for coffee tea and rubber business you have to take this much much percentages but there are other business also i tell you that there are other businesses also which uh, where we can see that there is a composite income which comes let's say if assessee is engaged in the manufacturing of sugar so he has he does all these activities he has some employees who who grows sugar cane for him once sugar cane get uh, is grown they cut that sugar cane cane and they bring this sugar cane into their factory and from these sugar cane they produce sugar so this person is also having a composite income so how much percentage we have to take it agriculture and how much should we keep it for non agriculture in that case percentage is not mentioned by income tax act so income tax has given us only for tea coffee, coffee and rubber so what about others so for others they have given us a method how you will calculate it so they say let's say first of all this is the starting point let's say this is the starting point when he started let's say it's a case of sugar cane let's say it's a case of sugar cane business where this person is first producing sugar cane 
and this sugar cane are then transferred to this factory from where he will be producing sugar so this is a starting point where he started he has started or he he has the he has his workers who work for him and they are growing sugar cane so once sugar cane is grown they cut the sugar cane and they bring this this is the point at which this sugar cane is cut that is agriculture activities is over and from this point your manufacturing activities or processing activities will start and ultimately your sugar will be produced your final product sugar will be produced so let's say assessi says sir that during this year i have incurred in my agriculture operations i have incurred rupees 3 lakh as an as expense and in my manufacturing my expense was somewhere about 5 lakh so total i have incurred 8 lakh rupees of expenses okay this is the expense which he has incurred and now i am selling this sugar for rupees let's say this sugar is getting sold for rupees 12 lakh tell me how much is the profit sir 12 lakh is the sale selling price of sugar 3 lakh plus 5 lakh 8 lakh are the expenses so my profit is 4 lakh see this 4 lakh this 4 lakh profit which this person has earned comprises of both agriculture activities and non agriculture activities also if it would have been tea coffee or rubber i would have simply applied that percentage is 40 60 35 65 25 or 25 75 as the case may be right but for other businesses like sugar sugar businesses or mango juices business because there might be a person who is uh, who has their mango trees who grows uh, who uh, grows mango trees then he, then they then there is a fruit they used to pluck the mango they bring that mango to their factory from that mango they produces mango juices so there are so many business which comprises of both agriculture non agriculture uh, activities so how we will be so how we will be uh, distributing between the agriculture and non agriculture in this case so here what we have to do is we have to up to this particular point it is agriculture income and from here it will be a your business income so we have to simply see at this point when my sugar cane are getting cut and they are being transported to our factory what is the fair market value of this sugar cane what is the fair market value of this sugar cane let's say i am telling you the fair market value of the sugar cane is 4 lakh this is the fair market value you just have to take the fair market value of the agriculture produce okay so tell me if i would have sold this sugar cane if i would have sold this sugar cane so my sugar cane would have a sold for rupees 4 lakh and 3 lakh are the expenses it means my agriculture income is 4 lakh minus 3 lakh that is 1 lakh is my agriculture income right okay now how much is my business income i we can simply say the total income was 4 lakh see 4 lakh how how we arrived this figure of 4 lakh 12 lakh minus all these expenses 3 plus 5 that is 4 lakh is my income so i can simply say sir out of 4 lakh 1 lakh would be my agriculture 3 lakh would be my non agriculture that this is the this is also the one method that you can use otherwise you can use another method also to so tell me how much is this sugar is getting sold so it is for 12 lakh and what are the expenses which you have incurred 5 lakh oh, okay 5 lakh is the processing expenses right let us assume that you do not have these farms you do not have this farm you just only produce sugar you just only produce sugar so you would actually bought this sugar cane from somewhere so if you will bought this sugar cane if you will just purchase this sugar cane from somewhere else how much you would have paid 4 lakh rupees sir because the fair market value of the sugar cane is 4 lakh rupees so this will become your purchase price so purchase price of sugar is 4 sugar cane is 4 lakh processing expenses is 5 lakh that is 4 lakh plus 5 lakh is the 9 lakh expenses which you are incurring so 12 lakh is the value of the sugar this is the selling price of sugar 12 minus 9 it will give you 3 lakh you can also calculate it through this method so how you will do it simple simply because in your exam it will be mentioned that this final product is getting sold for rupees 12 lakh this assessi has incurred cultivation expenses that is agriculture expenses of rupees 3 lakh manufacturing expenses of 5 lakh 
So how you will, how you will distribute the entire income into agriculture, non-agriculture income, you have to take the fair market value. You have to take the fair market value, which will also be mentioned in your question. So whatever is the fair market value, consider this as a selling price for this agriculture and purchase price for this business, right? So let's say 4 lakh would be this fair market value. 4 minus 3, 1 lakh would be your agriculture income and 12 minus 5 minus 4 because if this is the selling price for agriculture and this means that is the purchase price for the business, right? So this is how you will be able to calculate. Another important point is that how once you have your agriculture income and as well as non-agriculture income also, how you will calculate your tax, how you will going to calculate your tax. So this is the method which you have to use if you have agriculture income also and non-agriculture income also. First step, you have to compute your tax liability. You have to compute your tax liability including your agriculture income. I understand that we do not pay tax on agriculture income. But for computing the tax, for just for computing the tax, we have to do this calculation. So this calculation is that First of all, step one will we'll say that you have to calculate tax on agriculture income and non-agriculture income without sales. So include your agriculture and non-agriculture income. Step two, include your agriculture income plus basic exemption limit. If the assessee is following new tax regime, the basic exemption limit is 3 lakh. Otherwise, the basic exemption limit is 2.5 lakh. If the assessee is following optional scheme, if it's a senior citizen optional scheme, 3 lakh. If it's a super senior citizen optional scheme, the limit is 5 lakh. So second step, in second step, you have to compute your tax without this. Take agriculture income plus basic exemption limit. Let's say agriculture income is 4 lakh and basic exemption limit is 3 lakh. So you have to compute tax on 7 lakh. So what you will do? You will subtract step 1 from step 2. You will get this step 3. This is the amount of tax which you have to pay. And on this amount, you have to apply your cess. And yes. If the total income is not more than 5 lakh rupees, you have to apply the rebate also. Or in case of uh, new tax regime, you understand the uh, this amount is 7 lakh. If the total income does not exceed 7 lakh, you have to apply the rebate also. And then you will apply your sales. So this is something which is very important. How you will be computing your tax if you have agriculture and non-agriculture income also. Right. So this was about PGVP. We have done all the sections starting from section 28 till section uh, 44 we already we have already completed all these sections and we have already seen how this agriculture income is also computed so this uh, is a very important head pgvp you see uh, every time you see the first question the total income question comprises of pgvp mainly of pgvp and some other heads also so uh, we'll continue this in our next lecture of capital gain. So let's uh, meet in our next lecture. Till then, thank you so much. Bye and take care.